How does Christ heal our emotional suffering? And what's standing in the way of that healing? How do we overcome the wounds that hold all of us in bondage? Join us today as we answer those questions and more with Dr. Matthew Bruninger, author of the book, Finding Freedom in Christ, Healing Life's Hurts. I'm Father Dave Pavanka. I'm president of Franciscan University in Steubenville, Ohio. And you're watching Franciscan University Presents. Please stay with us. Welcome to Franciscan University Presents. I'm your host, Father Dave Pavanka. I'm president of Franciscan University of Steubenville. And as we enter Holy Week, we're discussing how Jesus Christ heals our emotional suffering and helps us find freedom in Him. I'm joined by our panelists, Dr. Regis Martin, professor of systematic theology here at Franciscan University, and Dr. Scott Hahn, the Father Michael Scanlon, professor of biblical theology and new evangelization here at Franciscan. I'm pleased to welcome our guest, Dr. Matthew Bruninger, Dr. Bruniger is an Associate Professor of Psychology here at Francis University and the founder of Wellspring Counseling and Coaching. He's also the author of the book that we'll be speaking about today, Finding Freedom in Christ, Healing Life's Hurts. Why did you write the book? How about that for a start? <laughs> That's a, I, I like the hard start. Let's good, get, good, good. get into it. So <clears throat> why did I write the book? I wrote the book because I have this privileged place as a therapist when the door closes to see so many people open their hearts and share the deep pain and suffering they're mm -hmm. in. And I have been surprised, and I don't know why I'm surprised, but time after time, how many good faithful Catholics who frequent the sacraments daily, weekly, are still hurting so much. Mm -hmm. There's so much hurt and pain. And I wanted to make an attempt to help people touch some of the, the healing that I think Christ wants to offer them. Mm -hmm. And um, sometimes we can't afford therapy. Sometimes we are afraid of therapy. Sure, sure. And so I wanted to offer a sort of safe Catholic perspective um, that could maybe guide people into some of this healing that I think God really does want for us. Good. And at the heart of that healing is ultimately freedom. Freedom. I, I'm not, I don't think I have any uh, particular charismatic gifts, <laughs> but I will say that I would beg to differ, but that's another, well, yeah, another fair, show okay, for another fair. day. Yeah. But prior to writing the book, the word freedom, I, it, it's hard to, it just was on my heart. It's the only way I could describe it. It just kept coming up over and over and over. And then one day in mass, I heard Galatians 5.13, mm -hmm. you were called to freedom, brothers and sisters. Mm -hmm. Only don't use it for things of the flesh, but to love and serve one another. And it hit me that um, it, it all sort of coalesced that the purpose for our freedom is so that we can be of maximum service to God. Mm. And I think our freedom, I think healing, the way I define it is that healing is the freedom to go wherever God calls you, to do whatever He asks of you, and to bring your suffering with you ultimately. Mm. Mm. Um, but, but freedom is about like putting first things first, yeah. loving and serving God. And we're, we want to do this, but we're impeded. I, I love what you've done in the book. Yeah. And for, from a priest's perspective, I, I get that same privilege, of, right, of seeing people. Yeah, but sure. to have you in really uh, a scientist, you know, understanding and, and realizing that that can take you so far and yeah, then yeah, grace yeah. can take... But when yeah. those two things come together, That's I think so something powerful. really powerful happens. Agreed. And Catholics sometimes are very scared, and, and rightfully so to some extent. Um, there can be some kooky, wacky stuff out there mm -hmm. in psychology. But... I wanted to offer a trusted perspective. Yeah, no, people I think so. so many places in Paul, freedom comes up, mm. but it's almost invariably against the background of the Exodus, because Christ as a new Moses yes. brings about a new Exodus. Yes. But the Exodus is not just freedom from Egypt, Pharaoh, bondage, Ooh. it's freedom too, it's yes. freedom for. Yes. So, you know, in yes. Paul, there are two mountains. Yes. Sinai is where the Mosaic law is given. You're free from Pharaoh. Mm -hmm. But Zion is where it's freedom to be holy. I love it. And the temple is built, it. you know, and the pilgrimages are there. And, you know, you think, well, that's salvation history. It's so much more. It's personal history. I love it. That I think, and that's the way I think about it. So oftentimes, so often we think that 
healing is, is freedom from suffering, freedom from pain. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that happens. Yeah. Um, but, but much more deeply and importantly, yeah. it's the freedom to yeah. actually go wherever God calls us and not be impeded by our pain, by our suffering, by our... So often we orchestrate our lives to avoid pain and suffering and hurt and not have our wounds touched. And so we're slaves to our wounds. Yeah. There's a, a certain complexity, <laughs> I, I think, that's built into this notion of freedom, yeah. and it enriches it, uh, yes. I, I think. Uh, on the one hand, it's having the capacity for total self-fulfillment. And that, I think, is conferred already. Not, not that it's automatic, but it's a gift that mm -hmm. nature provides. Mm -hmm. You have this ability to fulfill yourself, or at least to be aware that my destiny is out there and I need to reach it somehow. Mm -hmm. But the other half of the equation is the will. I mean, am I going to implement this plan? Yes. I can see the vision, but am I going to be given the grace uh, to pursue it? Yeah. And maybe that depends on circumstances which are outside your power yeah. to control. Yeah, I th I th Maybe that's where you come in. <clears throat> I, I think that's true. And sometimes, um, and we don't like this, but sometimes the simple answer, um, I think of De Crusade's book, Abandonment to Divine Providence, mm -hmm. sometimes the answer is a sort of radical acceptance. Yeah. And, and sometimes that means even accepting my own small, weak brokenness yeah. and learning how to hold that and not be reactive to it, right. not be, um, so scandalized, yeah. embarrassed that I have to like pretend. Yeah. You know, Kreeft, uh, Peter Kreeft has this, he calls it the universal cover up. Right. That we're all sort of pretending yeah. that we're not hurt, that we're okay. And I think there is something about really accepting where I am right now in the moment. Mm -hmm. And there are things I can't change about the world right. and sometimes about myself. Right. Yeah. But learning how to hold that mm -hmm. discomfort, yeah. um, what I find is that if we learn to hold it in the right way, and God comes into it and transforms it yeah. and will use it. Right. We'll see how he uses it to bring hope and healing to others through it. But yeah. we have to learn to hold it and accept it. Yeah, o Oscar Wilde has a great line. He said, we're all stuck in the ditch, yeah. but we're free to look up at the stars. Yeah. And we aspire, we long to reach those stars, I mean, yeah. even the most distant of, of, of all. But sometimes we're powerless yeah. uh, to arrive. Somebody once said that the predicament you're in may be insoluble, but your pain and suffering uh, are not meaningless. Yeah. There's a purpose. There's a purpose. You, you can always find a good use for pain. Yeah, and you know, Scott said something we were talking a couple weeks ago and something that has stuck with me. You said Christ, <clears throat> part of what you think Christ does anyway is he teaches us how not to be so afraid of suffering. That's the deepest healing. I, I think so. Absolutely. I think that, the, you know, so. when Paul is speaking of, he did not give us a spirit of slavery, to fall back into fear, mm -hmm. but a spirit of sonship, yeah. where we cry, Abba, Father. The only time Jesus ever prayed Abba was in Gethsemane, mm -hmm. where he mm -hmm. faced the greatest fears of his whole life, but he accepted the will of God. Yeah. And to me, you know, it's one thing to be delivered from suffering and its sources, illness and that sort of thing. It's another thing to be delivered from the fear of suffering. I was just talking to a high school classmate last night, and her husband was this great star and a Carnegie Mellon grad first in his class. And now after West Nile, he can't speak. He, he suffers from incontinence. And we were talking about this for almost an hour about how you face your fears and they can either paralyze you and enslave, or you can recognize that every hour, just yes. one hour at a time, yes. one five minutes yes. or one minute, you can unite your will to God's yes. will and just realize, okay, it isn't like the fears go away, she said. It's just that the fears become useful in God's right. hands. And isn't this really stands in contradiction that we live in a world, in a culture that says pain is bad, suffering is bad, yeah. difficulty is bad, and really to do anything you can to be able to escape from that. But, but it seems to me the nature of, of the nature of the cross is that we actually find God in the middle of that. And isn't that the, yeah. what's the greater miracle if, if we want to grade miracles? You know, the suffering is taken away, the healing comes from whatever, or happens sometimes in the middle of that, you discover God who loves you, who is present to you. And isn't that what you're yeah. hopefully yes. asking for, I, praying for? I think two thoughts on that. The first is, one way of defining suffering, I think, that comes out, by the time I get to the end of the book, something emerged for me, which was that one way of defining, sorry, not suffering, but healing, one way to define healing is to be able to suffer well. Mm -hmm. 
that oftentimes we don't suffer well because we're trying to avoid our suffering, we're trying to reduce, minimize, um, disengage from it. To suffer well, to be healed is to be able to suffer well. <laughs> but another point is that I follow this woman, on. I just hopped on Instagram a couple weeks ago, and I follow this woman who's dying of, of cancer. Mm -hmm. And she had a pretty miraculous healing a couple years ago. And she said, I'm grateful every day for that healing. It was miraculous. It gave me more time with my children. I'm grateful for it. But she said, and this, it really moved me. She said, but the greater miracle is what God has done in my soul. Mm -hmm. no. I mean, she had this miraculous healing. Now the cancer has returned, but she said the, the more miraculous healing is what God has done in her soul mm -hmm. through the suffering. And if you get there, Right. Oh, if you get there. Yeah, I remember um, Ann Shields, Sister Ann Shields. I don't know if you know her. She she was talking about suffering, and she says that she was praying one day, and just, she just sensed, if you will, suffering speaking to her and saying, "Don't you realize that I am your companion? I'm not somebody to be escaped, but I'm your companion, and that ultimately, in faith, leads us to Jesus." But this is in, in quite the contrast of what again what the world would say yes. freedom is. Yes. Freedom is the escaping of all of that. And you suggest, you, you seem to imply that in some ways it's our, it's us. It's yeah. us that is the problem, or that I'm the stumbling block, or you're the well, stumbling block. Yeah, so this is part of what I wanted to give people was hope. And I think oftentimes when we, look, when we think about um, how we're feeling, our anxiety, our depression, our sense of meaninglessness, we look out into the world and we say, it's because of everything out there. And what. I, if that's the truth, if, if I'm unhappy because of the way the world is, then I'm gonna be unhappy every day for the rest of my life. Because the world is never gonna be how or what I need it to be or want it to be. But what I've realized is I contribute so much to my own anxiety, depression, discomfort. And so I make a distinction in the book between suffering and pain. Yeah. And I think suffering is sort of natural. It's the, the, it's the, human, condition. It's the human condition. Pain is what we add to it, mm. we deepen and extend our suffering by adopting false beliefs. Um, so, for example, uh, my, my biological father leaves when I'm four years old. There's suffering. But I deepen and extend that, I add pain to it by adopting the belief, I'll never be able to be a good father, mm. I'll never be able to um, uh, find a spouse and be a good husband. Mm -hmm. Those beliefs make that suffering, they intensify it, they add suffering to it, they extend it and deepen the it. Chains the, the, the chains, the chains of suffering. Bind, you know, I, right. I was thinking to Paul again, you know, in his notion of freedom, eleutheria in the Greek there is the freedom of the children of God, mm. to be children in the presence of God the Father. I also think too of uh, what I could say Paul, but yeah. in Hebrews 5, uh, we have this passage, though a son, the son of God, in Hebrews 1, who becomes the son of man, in Hebrews 2, uh -huh. though a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. And thus being made perfect, thus being perfected, he becomes the source of eternal salvation to all of those who obey him. And not just a checklist of commandments, but wait, if the Son of God becomes the Son of Man and his human nature can only be perfected through suffering, then what makes me think he's going to exempt us? And if he doesn't, what's the purpose? To perfect us. Yes. It's like, that's almost painfully simple. Yes. Yeah. And you know, I was going to say, in the school of, of sanctity, and we, we've all signed up for that class. Yeah, yeah, you're in I mean, every I'm course. In, I'm in a remedial class. About, <laughs> every course is about suffering. I go to summer school. You know, <laughs> uh, the instinct, I, I think, for most of us is to reach for some immediate pharmacological solution. There's got to be some damn pill yeah. that will take care of this. I mean, you know, I'm oppressed by Joe Biden. Well, there's got to be some solution. Yeah. Is at the drugstore, I can take some yes. medication and I don't have to think about him. And Jesus gives us, I, I think, the instructive answer to that, to his own life. I mean, this is the season of Lent, uh, and there he is begging the Father, could you take this away, this chalice of suffering? Yeah. I'd, I'd rather forego that particular suffering, yes. and he doesn't. Yes. I mean, C.S. Lewis says that's the most profoundly paradoxical prayer in all of Scripture, it, the petition yeah. that's not answered. What's amazing about that, though, is Christ brings it to the Father. He brings his suffering to the Father. Yeah. And what we tend to do, I think, very often, and this is what gets us in trouble, this is where we're at fault, is when we get hurt or wounded by the world or by others, we oftentimes engage in self-protection strategies. Mm -hmm. And they make perfect sense. When you've been hurt or wounded, I adopt a posture so that I don't get hurt again. Yeah. 
and they can be really subtle and really clever. Yeah. So I've worked with incredibly prominent, wealthy, successful, smart, yeah, smart. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. holy, yeah, yeah, ho and <laughs> handsome, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And when you when you scratch the surface, you realize all of their success has been motivated yeah. by this sort of self protection. I don't want to feel insignificant. I don't want to feel insecure, like I did growing up. Somebody hurt them. Somebody wounded them. Made them feel smaller, insignificant. And so they say, I'll never feel that way again. So everything is this self-protection. Yeah. Well, the problem with that self-protection is, while it protects us initially, it often ends up causing more problems in the future. It traps us. You're trapped. Yeah, so yeah, now yeah, all of a sudden you go to work, and the second your boss gives you critical feedback, you're filled with anxiety because right. I need this job because this job right. shows me that I'm good enough. Right. Mm -hmm. um, I always, whenever I talk on the book, Scott, you've probably never heard this, but you will now. I always give the example of when we first moved to Steubenville. So because of my past, I have some, some hurts, wounds, and I want to be liked. I want to be liked. And we, we show up to Mass at St. Peter's, and there's Scott Hahn, Regis Martin, John Bergsma, the who's who yeah, yeah. of early 2000s, late 90s Catholicism, right? And I'm the most prominent Catholic figures, and I walk in with these four feral children, <laughs> right? And you're in, the back, you're in the last row, which gives you bird's eye view. Well. It's the publican seat. You know? <laughs> yeah, right. if, if we may, yeah. we're going to hold off to hear how this story is. Yeah. Yeah, no yeah. nail biter. Yeah. We have much more to discuss, particularly to find out what happens with this story. <laughs> Stay with us on Princess University Presents. We become members of a family that originates in God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, but that Holy Spirit overshadows the Blessed Virgin, so we become her children as well. People knew that when the Messiah came, that this promise would call them as a covenant people to be what? A light to the nations. And everybody is invited to walk through that door of mercy. The only key we need is the one that each one of us has. But it is my sin that opens up the mercy of God. Amen? Welcome back to Franciscan University Presents. We're discussing woundedness, suffering, and Christ-saving power. Um, but we were left in a church with your feral children. Okay. So how this so all got, out. So got these feral, yeah. absolutely feral children. We walk in, I sit down, and obviously, you know, Scott, Regis, John, they're all behind me, and they're all watching. You think. I think. <laughs> I assume. And my kids start acting like kids. Right. Right? And so now I feel the anxiety start to rise. Right? And, you know, the three-year-old's playing with the pew, and the seven-year-old is slumped over, and, you know, they're not praying the prayers in Latin, and I feel the anxiety rising, right? But Matthew, I remember that moment <laughs> because I, I approached Father Tim to ask if maybe we couldn't quarantine. Could leave, yeah, yeah, yeah. Now your kids are serving Mass. Right? So now I'm, I'm whisper yell. I do that, you know, the whisper yell where you bring all of the anger up into the and you say, so help me, God, I will take everything you love. <laughs> when I leave Mass and I am just, I'm angry, I'm anxious. Why? Because my kids won't be the way I want them right. to be. Yeah. And when I stop and I think about it, was the issue really my kids or did I set myself up to be anxious and angry? Right. And so what I do is I have this self-protection strategy. I want to look put together. I want, to, I want people to like me. Yeah. And I have an ex sometimes I have an excessive desire to be esteemed by others. You know, because of past hurts. And when I have this excessive desire, when I go into a situation with this excessive desire, I set myself up to be anxious, yeah. angry, depressed, right. hurt, yeah. because people in the world don't oftentimes act the way I want them to act. And my kids are a perfect example yeah, of this. Sure. They don't, they're not the perfect Von Trapp family. They're not harmonizing to all the scola and the chant and the, and so I feel anxious and angry it's because of this self-protection strategy. I've learned, get people to like you, and that way you won't be overwhelmed, you won't be hurt, you, you might get certain privileges and favors, and, but actually, it sets me up for anxiety, depression, meaninglessness. And I think the, the, the paradox is, and, and I think we've all experienced it in our own life, those who know us best, mm. and obviously the Lord, but those who know us best, who know my fears, who know my wounds, there's, there's actually a freedom in that. that it's like, finally, I don't, and, and I think that's what you're getting at is that, that we create this block. And if, yes. 
Yes. We first off let the Lord break into that yes. and, and realize that He's yes. trustworthy yes. and then begin to have other people into that. Well, this is, I think, these self-protective strategies. So often um, people are curious, well, I've gone to the sacraments for years, Dr. B. Mm -hmm. And we all know these people, right? So you, you hypothetically, there's people in the church who we know who um, have gone to the sacraments for years, sometimes daily, and they're still miserable wretches. I mean, they're just, mm -hmm. and you say, well, why aren't they any better off? We have these self-protection strategies that I think actually serve as sort of barriers to God's grace. So the analogy I tend to think of is you have the sun, you have a greenhouse, and you have these flourishing plants. And so long as the sun is able to shine into the greenhouse, the plants flourish. Yep. But our self-protective strategies serve as like a, a, an algae or moss right. over the greenhouse. Right. Yeah. And they block the sunlight out. And then the plants inside begin to die. Oh. When you identify the self-protection strategies, and ask God to remove them. But you, ha you really have to do work because ours, they can be very subtle. Right. We can, our success, our prominence our, can actually be self-protection. Yeah. When you remove them, all of a sudden the sunlight of the Spirit, God's Holy Spirit and the grace of God can flow unimpeded into us. Mm -hmm. But these barriers, I think actually we bring them oftentimes into our relationship with the Father and with mm -hmm. Christ. And we're not even aware that we're approaching Christ with our self-protection. Right. Yeah. There's a great example of that, uh, Evelyn Waugh, who was perhaps uh, the, the most distinguished Catholic writer, stylist of the last century. But uh, the carapace, the armor of his self-protection mm. was pretty massive. Mm. And he was accosted one day by a woman who said, Mr. Waugh, I know you're a Catholic, but you betray such a want of charity. Yes. How do you account yes. for that? Yes. You frequent the sacraments. And he said, Madam, I would scarcely be human if it weren't <laughs> for the grace of God. Yes. Yeah. Or, as my great. confessor put it, he's like, I said, what difference do these confessions make? He said, just think what you'd be if without them. You know, I know. Like, that's a good point, you know. Yeah. You know, you also do a job here of, um, of simplifying and synthesizing what I've learned from close friends who've gone through the 12 Steps program, yes. Yes. you know, going back to yes. Bill Wilson and yes. Dr. Bob and the, yes. the Oxford group and Arm yeah. Moral Rearmament. And, you know, one friend of mine liberated me from being that kind of perfectionist mm. father mm. by saying, you know, he was just describing what it's like on the other side of 50 and 60. And uh, he just laughed. He said, Scott, if I didn't know me, I might be impressed. And I'm like, I'm going to steal that line. It's wonderful. I mean, this guy's in the it's Rock wonderful. and Roll Hall of Fame. It's, it's wonderful. It's Dion DiMucci. And yes. I'm like, you know, and he's like, hey, Scott, I'm not much, but I'm all I think I'm about. all I think about. <laughs> <laughs> I, it, 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 it's, it's, it's a personal exodus. Yes. You are extracted from yes. yourself. You can see your life as a former slave. Yes. You can recognize that we've got to cross the desert yes. and then the Jordan and yes. then conquer the promised yes. land. This is no yes. sprint. This yes. is like a marathon. Well, you know, if it weren't life. for yes. our wives and children, we'd probably think we're we're pretty amazing husbands and fathers. Or our friars. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we, we, we've got people that would like to chime in. Um, but I think one of the things you said, I think that's really important is you said the work is yeah. that is you made yes. this reference that it's important and, and we really kind of have to pull up our sleeves and do it. And you also spoke of the Holy Spirit. And I yes. think those two things we can, it's not just, I just do the work and it's gonna, but it's it's the work with the light and the grace of the Holy yes. Spirit. The Holy Spirit can yes. help. I, I was thinking when you were talking about the father of lies wants to lie to us. So those those being trapped, it's often a lie. So to allow the Holy Spirit to speak to that, to speak yes. what is true. I mean, yes. Jesus is yes. the, the way, the truth and the life yes. so that it, it's a work, but it's also grace that come together. Yeah, in some ways, right? In some ways, these steps are about merely identifying and um, recognizing these barriers mm -hmm. to deep relationship with Christ. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and I kind of think that once you have that, once, once you see the ways that maybe you approach him like this, mm -hmm. uh, there's a great passage in the Catechism, um, I think it's 397, that says something like, Adam, Adam and Eve's fall is the result of disobedience but also all subsequent sin is a lack of trust in the goodness of God. Mm -hmm. So much of our self-protection is about maybe you're not good. Maybe mm -hmm. I need to take care of me. And it, our perfectionism, I mean, you need not look far in academia to see that sometimes our perfectionism, even our very jobs, we're attracted to these jobs because we might have old hurts and wounds mm -hmm. and being in a position of prominence and authority where we speak expert, mm -hmm. it keeps us feeling safe. Mm -hmm. But we need to strip these down. And so, so it is this work that's a, it's a commingling. I, I'm familiar with other books on healing that I think don't 
from my own personal perspective, invite enough work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think this is about putting pen to paper. Absolutely. I love how you do that. Like step by step, it's like take a blank piece of paper, do this. I thought you... You walk us through that really beautifully. I think, I think we have to do yeah. some. Otherwise, you're you're peddling a kind of cheap grace. Cheap yeah, grace, yeah, right? Yeah. This is this is really great. I mean, grace. That, that, I mean yeah. that was the, the the heresy of of Plato that virtue is yeah. just knowledge. If I tell you what you're supposed to do, yes. just say no yes. when vice comes yes. around. Right. You'll be fine. You'll right. be a saint. Right. This is work, and you're, and you're going in and you're looking at deep dark places and you're identifying your fears and you're seeing them. The first time I did something like this, I remember I was actually down in Honduras. And I locked myself in a room for a day and I I did these steps. And I remember the freedom I felt for the first time seeing myself on paper in black and white. Mm -hmm. The good, the bad, and the ugly. My deepest fears, my deepest shames, my hypocrisy. These things that I tried to hide and and the ways I tried to manipulate the world and control people. There it was. And I could give it, it's liberating. And I could bring God into that. And I could say, God, here I am. Here's what I do. But now we're having a real conversation. This is heart speaking unto heart for the first time. I, I think there's an analogy here that applies so profoundly well. It's apt with Scripture. Yeah. That Scripture is not an individual's narrative, but a nation's narrative. Because yes. we're not reading the book of another nation's founding. We're reading about, well, what God said, you know, Israel's my firstborn son, so younger siblings take note. And, you know, I think it was Northrop Fry in the Great Code who said that mm. the Old Testament was written by a people who were constantly failing at empire building. You know? <laughs> but when you, when you consider the Jews, I mean, they're not known for excessive humility. Yeah. But when you look at the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, I mean, this is a statement of corporate humility mm. through countless humiliations. Mm. And they bequeath that to the human race yes. as a testimony to God's patience but how it's not just a diagnosis you're sinful. It's a narrative of a pilgrimage that lasts a lifetime for individuals, but centuries for nations. And when you pick it up and read it that way, especially the Psalms, those become prayers Mm -hmm. of an anguished heart, you know? I mean, grateful, praise, and all of that stuff. But, you know, the the Psalms of complaint are are approximately 44% of the 150 Psalms. Well, you know, you're not complaining about God. You're complaining to God. And that's exactly what our fears prevent us from doing. A hundred percent. I cannot tell you how many people I meet when you scratch it. I mean, these are people, again, these are, these are religious. These are people in schools of spiritual direction. These are, who, when you scratch the surface, they say, I'm just so afraid. If God saw this part of me, he wouldn't love me. Mm-hmm. As opposed to, um, there's an old Monsignor Esif in the Diocese of Scranton, a holy man, mystical man. And one time a buddy of mine went to confession with him and he said, you're angry at God. And he said, I want you to go out into a field far away from civilization, and I want you to yell at your father. Give it to him. Just, he can handle it. And the beauty there, I think sometimes we, our fear, our um, desire for perfection, our desire to want to be where we're not yet, prevents us from having a real relationship with the father. We don't complain. We don't, my kids, They have no qualm about complaining, That's right, about yelling. They're, they're kid, dad, dad, right? I run up the stairs. I think somebody's hurt or bleeding. Get me a towel. I'll get you a <laughs> towel. I thought somebody was dead up here. They have no problem crying out to me. And yet I approach the father with this sterile, I have to, right, engage in impression management. Yeah, that's what I love, again, in Paul, where he talks about that we approach God not as a master, but but as a father. And I just, I continually have that image of the child that runs and jumps in in his father's lap and and to be able to be present to that. And and I think that's, again, what what you do is, um, it's not intimidating. The Mm -hmm. way you present in the book, it's it's not like, yes, it's work, but not such that I can't do it. It's really, it's really down to earth, practical, concrete. Child's play. It's, yeah, yeah, Child's yeah, play. yeah, yeah. But yeah. It, it just, in, in this conversation, it just reminds me time and time again, I love one of the quotes of St. Francis that I love. He says, um, what we are before God is what we are and nothing else. And I remember praying in like, almost like an apology and nothing else, but that's not an apology. Yeah, yeah. It's actually a celebration is what I am before the Lord. When everything else is stripped away, yes. the Lord sees me. And we just, again, we, we build these walls because and this is the nature yeah. of the incarnation yeah. is God wants to move through that and break yes. through that. And this is about through. finding and identifying the walls, yeah. putting a chink in our armor. Yeah. And, and um, that I, I, I do want to say, even though I think it's, I try to simplify it, I try to make it manageable, it is undoubtedly 
work that takes courage. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it feels risky and it requires vulnerability. Mm -hmm. the, because so much sometimes of, of this wall gets woven almost into our personalities. It's just how I've known myself to be. It's, right. I, I've adopted this way of being and it's worked for some period of time. And now I'm starting to see the ways it's not working. Yeah. And that can take, um, Flannery O'Connor has this great line. She says, human beings vigorously resist grace because grace transforms you right. and change is hard. Yeah. Yeah. And it, this is... But I think, yeah. Matt, just the, what you do is you actually raise the, the possibility that there's something yeah. else. I, I, oh. You allowed me with grace to be able to write the introduction, but I talked about that one scene that they're dead and they don't even know it. Yes. I mean, I think people have become accustomed to their being trapped. They're accustomed to their wounds. They really don't know that there is something more. Or is that, and you do a beautiful job that says there's something yeah. more and out the there. And the freedom, like... There's a dynamism to God's grace in that when we let these walls down, which is vulnerable and it feels like a risk, life, life takes on, I mean, it gets wild. Mm -hmm. I have been to places and spaces and met people. It's just so amazing how God uses you when these walls fall. We'll be right back with more Franciscan University Presents, so please stay with us. Many of the wounds that we have won't be removed in this world. I think this is a place where we'll still have suffering. And I think some of that's just the human condition. I think there are, are other issues where we'll continue to suffer because of our own choices, whether that's ignorance on our part or we continue to make self-defeating choices. So I, I, I guess in response, some things can be fixed and can be healed and God does take away, but other things we're asked to carry as part of our journey as a Christian. Welcome back and thanks for joining us. You're watching Franciscan University Presents, which we, we record here in the Com Arts Studio at Franciscan University in Steubenville. Our students are operating all the cameras and the equipment and our theology professors, Dr. Regis Martin, Dr. Scott Hahn, and myself and, and Dr. Matthew Bruninger, who is the author of Finding Freedom in Christ. We're talking about removing barriers that, that uh, separate us from God's healing grace. So you talk about some steps and, mm -hmm. and to be clear, it's not this, you do step one through five, it's all done. Whoa. So that's important. But, yeah. but I think I like the fact that you give us a process, yeah. something to work on. It's not magic. No, it's not. It's not magic. And, and again, the end, the end of it, it's about removing barriers that we put up from, you know, that prevent God's grace from flooding in mm -hmm. these barriers of protection and what God does with you after that. I don't know, mm -hmm. and I don't claim to know, yeah. and thank God I don't know, but I'm utterly confident that if we begin to remove these barriers that keep us enslaved and that hold us back and that are chains, mm -hmm. God is going to call you to places and spaces, and he's gonna use you as this radical instrument of his love and healing, wherever you are. Maybe it's at the kitchen sink, mm -hmm. maybe sure, it's in a sure. classroom, maybe it's in a, a friary, but you're gonna be used, and you're gonna be open to being used. But that's what this is about. It's about allowing Christ in, God in, in a way that he hasn't been before and letting him direct you wherever you go. And so I try to lay out these steps, but you might summarize them ultimately as daily conversion. Yeah. Every day, this is every day. It's not a one and done. Right, right, At right. At the end, the, the last step is every day you wake up and you say, God, I'm totally yours, radically and unreservedly take away the things that get in my way of being useful to you. Mm -hmm. And to whatever extent you do that, Lord, I will do and go wherever you want me to. And that's daily. And, and sometimes it's hourly. Yeah. Sometimes it's by minute. And I will do that. I'll do whatever you ask, Lord, but I need your help to remove those things that are holding me back. My selfishness, my fears, my resentments. My, take them away so that I can be your instrument. Well, here's a, the, the question I have. It may seem naive, sure. but this is what puzzles me. Sure. If you believe that God looks straight through yeah. with eyes of love yeah. and he doesn't define you yes. by your sins, your failings, yes. by those barriers, yeah. he, he doesn't even see the barriers. He sees you right yeah. to the quick. Yeah. Then why would it be so difficult to confess those barriers to him if he's not bothered by them? Yeah, because, because I, I think it's back to that catechism passage. We don't trust in the goodness of God. From the fall of man, Adam and Eve, the first thing they do after they fall yeah. is, hide is they hide. Yeah. Because what if, like, what if you don't really love us? What if you really yeah. 
or punish us. What if you're going to punish us? And what's amazing is, and this is the second step in the book, I think most of us need to have our image of God rehabilitated. Yeah. And so the second step is about admitting where we actually are yeah. in our view of God and trying to um, deepen our sense of God as loving and good. And yeah. Because you're right, but most of us know it here. I mean, again, let me here. return to that, that, yeah. that skepticism yeah. I have. Yeah. Uh, I have a granddaughter yes. uh, who will sometimes do this, hide herself, yes. as if that prevents us from seeing yes. her. Yes. It, yes. It's silly. It's preposterous. Yes. I mean, God can see you, so why yes. are you hiding? Yes. If right. you know that, yeah. then why don't you just can, a, a, accept the fact I'm naked, yeah. I stand before God, you know why? and He doesn't despise me? Well, because that's what we're not sure of. Because I'm hiding because maybe you're like my father. I'm hiding because maybe you're like... Um, you know, I, I can't tell you how many veterans I've worked with whose fathers were in the military, mm -hmm. father's father, and their fathers were rigid and authoritarian, and they were, and there's no room for weakness, there's no room for your feelings, there's no room for failure. And here we are, deeply in touch with the fact that we're hurting broken failures. And if God's anything like those men in my life, well, he doesn't want to see that. And you speak to that specifically, that, that yeah. some of our Protestant brothers and sisters do this unmerited grace that God just loves us and that's his nature. That sometimes we as Catholics, there's something subtle that says we just got to yeah, work hard. We got to earn together. this. We got to earn this. You really got to earn this. And there is a real sense, I think, um, yeah, our Protestant brothers and sisters sort of buy this a little easier sometimes. Mm -hmm. It's just God, he just loves you. Nothing you do, nothing you, unearned, unmerited, un, right. and we have that. Yeah. And we can trace this story that Scott's talking about, this narrative, this history of a people. Right after the fall, that first gospel, the Proto-Evangelium, God says, like, I'm going to make this right. I'm going to make this right. I'm going to fix this. Mm -hmm. And then he leads the people out of Israel, calls them to freedom again. I'm going to fix this. And then when the serpent's biting everyone, he heals them again, right? I'm going to fix it. Time and time again, God is saying, I'm going to fix it. He tries to reveal himself to us. I'm going to fix this. I'm going to fix you know, this. I'm going to fix this. On the closing pages of John Paul's Crossing the Threshold of Hope, mm. he has what I thought was a breakthrough, and that is original sin doesn't turn people into atheists. It transforms the face of God from father to master. This the is, father, yes. child, master, yes. slave. You know, yes. I think of my yes. own dad who was on a pedestal because he was in General Douglas MacArthur's honor guard, mm. so he was strict. He wasn't, he he wasn't um, authoritarian in the sense of, you know, being verbally brutal or anything like that. But I just didn't. He was unapproachable. Yes. And then one day we were driving. I was maybe 16 or 17, and he mentioned that his father had depression for the last 10 years of his life, and then just mentioned that he took his own life. Oh my God! Like my grandfather who died before I, right before I was mm. born. And it's just like, mm. and, and then he said, I also suffer from it. And there was a sea change. I mean, yes. it was like, yes. and I'm like, Dad, I feel like I didn't even know you. How yes. could I know you if yes. I didn't know what happened to your father? Yes. And he said, let's talk about it after dinner tonight. And it was like an entirely transformed relationship. The heart. Yeah. yeah, and you know, something different. You mentioned the kitchen sink about five minutes mm. ago. And I remember this altercation at the kitchen sink. <laughs> with my firstborn son, who's now my best friend mm. at 40, and he mm. says the same of me. But I mean, of all of our six kids, he would complain to me more than all of them combined, you know? <laughs> and the one altercation we had at the kitchen sink when he was 16, we almost came to blows. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he was just, le and he's so rhetorically sharp. <laughs> he knows exactly, <laughs> it's you know? So it's worse. <laughs> and I, I, you know, I feel like a failure as a father. Mm. And he said, well, you make me feel like a failure as a son. I'm like. You know, no. Know. And then all of a sudden, you know, our relationship was transfigured. Scott. But I mean, I wouldn't wish what we went through on my worst enemy I because I, I was on the brink of despair for, for weeks, probably a couple of months. How, mu how much, and look, I think we're all striving to be good holy men, but how often do we hurt and harm unintentionally? Absolutely. Right. Exactly. Our friends, our kids, our... In I'm passing. Giving, in passing, and I give them an image of maybe how God might think about them. It. it that's the beauty. It's the gift of our role as fathers, right? And we're all fathers here. It's the gift of our role is that we leave a deep and lasting impression in our children, spiritual or biological, of how God might be. Mm -hmm. He's given us that, that privileged position. And so why do we not, go, even though he sees it, because we put this face of master, of authoritarian, of, and so that second step is so important. I mean, my first step is we have to admit that there's actually a problem. I got to be honest with myself. There's a problem. And 
It's about radically turning our life over. Yeah. But the second step is, I'm not going to do the rest of the steps if I don't trust that you actually love me. Right. Because the rest of the steps yeah. are going to be inviting you in and showing you some deep recesses of my heart that I've been ashamed and embarrassed about. And, and if I'm not sure that you actually love me, that you can hold that, I'm not going to go there with I you. Did, I did a... The reason I love this is I love the theme of freedom. I really think the scriptures, there's a whole, all the scriptures is a story about a God who wants his people to be free. But I did a book on it a number of years ago. In the end of it, I speak of what you just stated. God wants us to be free so that we can be loved and so we can love. And I remember someone that's came into it. my office and said, that's it. Like, that's, that's the it. big crescendo. It's that's like, it. sorry, that's all I got. Right? <laughs> that's it. But, but isn't that it? I mean, that it, it is it. fundamentally that, that I want to be able to, I want to be loved, of course. Absolutely. I also want to be able to love. Yes. And my, my brokenness, my bondage yes. inhibits me from actually being able to love the way that the Lord loves. I come to something very similar at the end. It's that God heals us so that we can love the way we were created to love, yeah, yeah. so we can receive. I mean, that. maybe I played, did I play Jura? <laughs> you know, you quote, I think, a Dr. Johnson who said Freud is wrong, yeah. you know, because it's not about sex as the most primal drive. Yeah. It is about connecting with other people. Yeah. And it's like, well, that's so obvious. So obvious. I mean, it's only I when you take it down to the lowest, most base, when you debase oh, the human, then you would go with Freud. Yes. But, you know, there's this sense that we want to be something more than the animal instincts yes. that can enslave we us. We want and, this. We want yeah, exactly. I mean, really, yeah. the, the deepest desire is that we might be able to see the face of God. Yeah, exactly. And we hope that that face will be loving. Yeah. It'll bear the countenance of, of Jesus, yeah. a tenderness, yeah. a gentleness. And I, I, I mean, mean, he writes ourselves. straight with crooked lines. Yeah. But those lines he loves. Uh, and uh, I had a friend, Lorenzo Albacetti, he died a couple of years ago. And whenever he was introduced as a moral theologian, he would always correct uh, the, the, the statement and say, no, I'm an immoral theologian <laughs> because I sin. I'm, I'm a recidivist. I sin all the time. But that one got traction. Uh, oh, yeah. yeah. And it's true. Yeah. I mean, we, we are all in the same boat and That's it's right. sinking fast. That's right. And, and to be honest, if we could, if we could let down the masks and the way that, you know, as Kreef said, that we, we universally cover it up and be a little more human with each other. Mm -hmm. I mean, what I love about therapy is I get to see like humans. I get to see deep humanity. And so often we kind of walk around and we, we've got our, our blazers and our elbow patches and our robes. And, mm -hmm. But like we don't get to see, I don't get to see your fear, your insecurity, right. your love. Yeah. And if we could connect at that level, it's so human. It's so genuine. And it's, it's interesting just listening to you say that, Matt, because I think the penitent that comes to me to confession is often worried about what am I going to see. I but that's what I see. And it's so, it's so beautiful. It's so sacred. Same. It's so honest. Same. It's so real. If they could just realize that that's, that's what I see. I feel it, more it, connected to people yeah. in those moments where yeah. they share their fears or their insecurities or their shame or their yeah. embarrassment. I feel it's, it's true. It's something that's human. Honest. Right, it's right, human. Right. You, you, I mean, we all know, we remember that, that scene in the, in the Chosen where Mary Magdalene returns, I mean, after she's had a bad night, a lapse. Yeah, yeah. And, and Jesus doesn't say, okay, let's itemize the sins. You, you, you've done it again. What, what, what's the matter with I you? Know. Can't you shape up like, like a saint? And he tells her pretty much, I'm only interested in your heart. Give me your heart. And of course, she has yeah. given Jesus her heart. Actually, Everything else. Yeah. Everything else fades into irrelevance. Love that. I love, and, and yeah, we put these protective barriers around the heart because the heart is tender, the heart is sensitive, and the heart has been hurt. We've really been hurt and wounded by people. And so we protect our heart rather than giving our heart to God and saying, mm -hmm. I trust it's you to protect it. Yeah. I trust you to protect it. And that's what he wants. And, and so it's just about giving ourselves the space to remove the protection and give our hearts to the Father. Yeah. I think that, I mean, that's a nice summary of the book, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to give our hearts. To well, the you know, the, the really essential thing about faith is the recognition that it's not just in your head, yeah. it's in your heart. It's a movement of the will, and that involves trust, a willingness to entrust yourself to another, you know, in whom you repose absolute mm -hmm. confidence. He's not going to betray me. Mm -hmm. He's not setting me up. You know, he, he's not ready to pounce the next time I, I stumble yeah. and fall. Yeah. That's you know, where he wants to find me. Yeah. You know, that idea of the heart, it also has to be united to the head. Although the danger is always, of course, that it's going to reside exclusively mm -hmm. in the head. Mm -hmm. um, but 
you mentioned a moment ago, you know, about how we hope that we will see the face of the Father and He won't despise us, you know. But I mean, it's a hope that is rooted in a faith. Yeah. And the certitude of faith is more certain than all of the proofs of science. Yeah. Because of the divine authority, He's given us His Word, the Word became flesh, and when He rose again, we can say, I believe in God the Father Almighty. And He doesn't exhibit Almighty to kind of dominate. He's Almighty to save. He's Almighty to heal, to cure. If you trust me, it's going to be a, a long process. We call you patient for a reason. Yes. You know? Yes. You know, at the same yes. time, I have to admit that Doctors so often are better at diagnosing than they are at curing mm -hmm. or healing. You were saying before, you know, uh, they, they, they talk about it, but they don't give you any work to do. Yeah. And I think that's what the Father does, you know. Yeah. He doesn't crush us yeah. with the works that we do as children of God. But there is a slow liberation, but it isn't like you feel like I'm finally free, totally, yeah. you know. Right. And uh, I, I think what you're doing here is not just diagnosing the problem. I mean. People are so good at cultural critique yeah. and ecclesiastical gossip and yes, all of the yes, other things yes. too. But I mean, I actually find practical steps to get out of the bog, yeah. you know, the swamp yeah. of ourselves, yeah. especially. Yeah. You know, that's very positive. And, and I think what you you do beautifully again, Matthew, is you. It's a journey. It's a yeah. process. It's it's a, a road that the Lord is inviting us to, and He's present with us as we go along. That's beautiful. Next, our panel and our guests are going to share the final thoughts on emotional suffering and God's desire to heal us. Please stay with us. God in His wisdom said, if people play a part in damaging a person, then I should use a person as instrumental in bringing people to healing. And so in the therapeutic relationship, you have this person who is open to creating unconditional love, unconditional care for the individual, and then allowing them to go through the stages of increased awareness, uh, acknowledgement of what is going on in their lives. An interesting part is that individuals who are suffering sometimes become very closed off to other people and they're more concerned about protecting themselves so that they have to understand that. And so as you go through, there's that acknowledgement and awareness, understanding, and then going into action. How am I going to change? And in that change, again, if you're feeling safe, you're more likely to risk because change is risk. And so the therapist can actually accompany you on that. And if you're dealing with a therapist who is Catholic, Christian in nature, they then begin to open you up to an awareness of God. When you see the world through a Catholic lens, you see God's hand at work in human history. You see the true, the good, the beautiful. Franciscan University of Steubenville's Master of Arts in Catholic Studies is an online program that offers courses in literature, biology, art, theology, psychology, all taught from a distinctively Catholic perspective so you can see the world with Catholic eyes. Find out more about the Masters in Catholic Studies. Go to franciscan.edu slash mcs. Welcome back to Franciscan University Presents. Uh, we've come to our final segment, uh, Regis. Yeah, uh, uh, I had something in mind, but then you said a word that was a trigger, uh -oh. bog. Uh, <laughs> it evoked uh, this image of poor Baron von Munchausen, whose story I really must share, because it's wonderfully illustrative of, uh, of your book, The Thesis. Uh, here's this guy who gets stuck in a bog and he can't get himself out. So what does he do? He grabs his beard thinking, I'll pull myself out mm. by yanking the beard. And of course, he just sinks deeper and deeper. Yeah. So th the point is, you can get out of the bog, but you have to reach for someone to help you who's right there yes. poised yes. to pull you out of that, that bloody bog. Yes. And, and so like the woman who suffers from the hemorrhage, yes. she's gonna get healed, but she has to evince a hunger for healing. She has to touch the outer garment worn by Christ. Then she experiences this sudden surge of power. Jesus experiences it. He turns around looking to see who touched me. You've got to evince the touch. That's it. And uh, that book, 
The cover, I, I think, shows us a touch. He's yes. reaching into the wounded side that of Jesus. Good. I'm not sure that's medically accurate. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's scripturally true. I mean, Scott, you, you can tell us, but I mean, Caravaggio took certain liberties not only with art, but with his life. Yeah. I mean, he was a mess. But that is a wonderful, a wonderful uh, uh, example, image of how grace works. Yes. Yeah. That's yeah. great. Thanks, Regis. Scott. <sighs> <laughs> Carfaccio. <laughs> anyway, back to the hemorrhaging wall. <laughs> you know, she had to overcome her fears to even get into that crowd. Yes. She had no business being there. She was defiling everyone who touched. Yeah. She touched, you know, and, and if they knew her, condition, they knew her displacement, you know. Uh, but she had this relentless desire to be healed and a faith that was just unconquerable. And you have a, you have a treatment of, of Jacob in Genesis that I love because it's only when Jacob was willing to kind of wrestle the angel of the Lord all night. I mean, the angel could have pinned him in a minute. But I mean, God lets us wrestle with him if we overcome that fear. You know, and then you go on, I think, in the next page to talk about uh, Father Walter Chiswick, the great Jesuit who was mm -hmm. imprisoned in Siberia. And he, um, he speaks of the primacy of self. Yes. And when I read that, I immediately rem remembered, you know, what my friend Dion would say, I'm not much, but I'm all I think about. Think. You know? <laughs> if I didn't know me, I might be <laughs> impressed. And those are like liberating comments because you can laugh at yourself and then you can also sort of enter into divine laughter. The very fact that Abraham had to wait a century to get a son, and then God prescribes the name will be Hitzok, Isaac, laughter. Yes. You know, so yes. the rest of their life they can just enter into a joy. I think that's what your book is doing. I am so thankful that you wrote it. I am so honored that, yeah. you know, right. Emmaus Road got to publish this and Thank hopefully you. more as well. But um, I, I really believe that our Lord has anointed you with a gift and I don't mean to embarrass you because I always feel like the donkey that Jesus sometimes rides. Same. But um, yeah, I would just say keep up the good work and yes. thanks for this. I appreciate it. Okay. Yeah. Final thoughts. Final thoughts. That if the problem, if we're wounded because life has failed to love us, others have failed to love us the way we were created to be loved, the solution to that is to touch love. Mm -hmm. It's to be touched by Christ, the touch. and. So often we orchestrate our lives in ways to protect ourselves. I think of the woman at the well. That's why I named my therapy practice Wellspring. Mm -hmm. I think of the woman at the well. She's there at the hottest time of the day. She has orchestrated her life so as not to feel the wound of shame. Yeah. And we do this so often in subtle and not so subtle ways. We orchestrate our life to not feel or have our wounds triggered. And yet Christ is there waiting for her. Mm -hmm. And he cuts to the heart of it. And so the final word is that God wants this freedom for us. He wants it. And sometimes it's radical. Sometimes I've met people, I've experienced in my own life where God will sometimes just take the, the anxiety, the depression, the meaningless, he'll just strip it away. But then there's another kind of healing that occurs where it's like a Pauline healing where the thorn in our flesh remains. Mm. It's a wound, it hurts. But God gives us the freedom to go wherever he calls us and to bring the thorn with us. Mm. Because through that thorn, He'll shine forth his glory and his perfection. And that wound will become a source of grace and, and healing for others. And so this is a journey. It's a journey I hope people are willing to undergo because in so many ways, I think this is what our church needs. Our church um, doesn't need more people to step into the sort of sphere of ecclesial bomb lobbing. And what we need is people who are free, mm -hmm. people who are free instruments to go wherever God calls them. Um, and to love radically, and sometimes that it, it's not always missionary in the sense of going out. Sometimes it's, I'm able to be free to love my children better, yeah. to be free of the fear of, of my kids being an expression of me, and to let them be kids, to love my spouse, to love my friend. I mean, God wants to use us. And what I've found personally, and I'll, I'll end with this, is that when I've touched this freedom, and to the extent that on a daily basis, I live these steps, this conversion, God has used me in ways that I couldn't have imagined because I know who I am, Scott. I, I, I know where I've come from. I know what I'm about. And the fact that God would use me to bring hope and healing and light and love to other people 
it's amazing. Kind of humbling. It's 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 humbling, but it, man, it's so deeply meaningful. Amen. Thanks, Matthew. And, and God is using you. Um, if you'd like to learn more about today's topic, we have a free handout of the foreword and the introduction from uh, Dr. Bruninger's book, Finding Freedom in Christ. The short excerpt is yours, free simply by going online to faithandreason.com slash presents or by calling the number we'll provide momentarily. Um, this is, as I stated, uh, uh, an area that I just think is so beautiful and so much needed. We live in a country, it's part of our DNA is freedom, and yet we use the word freedom to do awful things and to take advantage of people. I mean, the word of freedom, I'm free to choose. I mean, it's just, it's been so basely yes, abused. Yes. Um, but at the heart, I think, of, of the gospel, the heart of the narrative of the scriptures is ultimately a God who wants us to be free. I love every morning we pray the canticle, blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, who has come to his people to set them free. Every I mean, Zechariah, Jesus is not even on the, that's why, blessed he's come to set us free. Uh, and I think it's a gift the Lord wants to give to us. Two thoughts. You would know better than I because you have children. But when you have a little child and they fall down, they're two, three years old, they fall down, they skip their knee, they come up and you kiss them, you hug them, you pat them on the back, and she runs off and she's fine. Um, all she needed was the touch of her father, you know, or a touch of her mother, right? But we grow up and we believe that's not enough anymore, right? Yes. So, so we come before the Lord as a grown man and we're broken and we're hurt and we've fallen down. But somewhere along the line, we've believed the lie that says, a touch of the Father isn't enough, it's all, but, it's but, but in fact, it's in, in fact, it is. And, and when we see that, and I think the way you talk, Matthew, about how the Lord can meet us in the middle of the suffering, and, and perhaps that's, I'm actually just this weekend, was spending some time with a woman um, who's dying, and, and she's going to die in a matter of weeks. Uh, and, and I said, you know, what specifically do you want to pray for? And she said, uh, I want to pray that I will die well and then I will die like the saints. Mm -hmm. And she was talking about she wasn't going to get the miracle that she, maybe she didn't get the miracle that she wanted, but that is a miracle. That is grace in the midst of profound yes. pain, literally pain and suffering for her to say, I want to die well. I want to die like the saints. Mm -hmm. That's a woman who's profoundly and radically free, 100%. right? Radically free. And I think that's what the Lord's invited us to, and that's what you invite us to. So Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gift and the grace uh, that is freedom for freedom Christ has set us free. May we know your healing, your presence, your touch, so that we might love and be loved freely. May the Lord bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. God bless. Download a free handout on today's topic at faithandreason.com slash presents. You can also watch past episodes of Franciscan University Presents or request the handout by emailing us at presents at franciscan.edu. Or reach us by phone for today's handout by calling 800-783-6447. That's 800-783-6447.